I'm going to say how great rehearsal is. We were in here yesterday, and I saw a guy hanging from the rafters trying to fix the lights. I was standing right up there in the production room, and I felt like I was about to fall off a cliff just watching this guy. And I thought, if he can do that, and you want me to give a talk in front of 2,000 people, no problem. Just don't ask me to be that guy. So my name is Ari Gentry, like Sam said. Oh, thank you. I'm an economist turned a biotech entrepreneur. I had the lucky fortune of being unhappy in my work and deciding to volunteer at a biotech lab where I met the most passionate people in the world, scientists who are working for practically pennies in order to create cures that would save people we love. And I thought there's no greater meaning than this because we look around. We're in this because of the individual, the people. Sure, we want to change the world, but we want to take care of our loved ones, we want to take care of ourselves. And this mattered so much that I changed everything that I was doing. It's about finding that meaning and then doing something about it. So when I talk about the great conversion, during convergence, I'll talk about the macro scale, but also think about what's going on in your own life. And I'm going to challenge you throughout this talk to find your meaning and then to do something about it. And I hope that I can show you a few ways to make that possible. The easy part is knowing when you found that meaning. Trust me, you're going to see it. First, I want you to really take a minute away from the talk and look at the world around you. Be daring enough to look at the person next to you. Look at your hands. Look at something. And try to look beyond the obvious. I can see you're not doing it. So I'm going to wait just a little bit longer. I mean, think. Do you see some tools in your hands when you see your neighbor? Maybe you see a friend. When you look at your body, maybe you see 100 trillion microbes. So this is what scientists have recently discovered, that we are, in fact, only 10% human and 90% bacterial. When we look around at the world around us, we're just a small speck in what's really going on. And these microbes are the basis for much of disease, gum disease, digestive disorders, even obesity. That can be scary. But the first step is to see. You understand. And the fear dissipates as you gain ways to enrich your lives. Science allows us to see the unseen. It is our doorway to discovery. And many people aren't seeing the ways that the world is changing around us, societally, culturally, scientifically. But myself, as a perennial outsider, a misfit, if you will, and a keen observer of human behavior, have noticed a few thematic trends in the way that scientific research is being done in ways that few, if any, would have thought of. And that's what I want to share with you. We're encountering more than a scientific revolution, like what happened in the 16th through 18th centuries. We're encountering a scientific evolution because of increase in access due to technological increases, decreases in costs. More people than ever before are involved in science in some way, whether as a consumer, a researcher, an entrepreneur. We start out by looking at the changing landscape of this work. In research, a lot of times you can go back and say, what's the bottom line? In the end, you follow the money. Where science began to take shape and create the foundations of the work that we now do was in gentleman science in the 16th century. This is Robert Boyle, who started out as a theologian and an alchemist, alchemy. But he created the foundation for modern chemistry that we still practice today, funded by wealthy families by royals, they influence the discovery of the time. Or one of my personal favorites, Charles Darwin. He looked to the past and looked to the current to see how we came to be how we are. And he still had an eye in mind for what we would become. He tells us that science is not to be feared. It is to be embraced. The lack of knowledge, again, 
we should understand that it's there and attempt to fill it because more is to be gained by understanding and by seeing. Soon, governments, academia, started to fund science, and so we saw a shift totally to the university. Again, complemented by corporate entities like Novo Nordisk. Today, we have a hybrid incubators. It's a combination of academic institutions letting researchers create companies, but they still run the hefty price tag of $6,000 per month, an unwieldy sum for any scrappy entrepreneur. Until recently, 2008, Matt Cowell and Jason Bogue started to meet weekly in Cambridge, Massachusetts to talk about ways that science could become more open, more accessible, and they as amateurs were doing scientists, science as hobbies because of their passion. But they knew that the infrastructure had to be reshaped. So in their weekly meetings, much like the Royal Society of the 16th century, they termed DIY bio or do-it-yourself biology. It's a combination of the maker culture, the hacker culture, with traditional research. Soon they knew that just talking about it wasn't enough, although thousands had flocked to it to a global mailing list, talking about techniques of doing research on the cheap, in your bedroom, at your school, under the radar. There had to be more, a place for people to gather. In the end, it is about the people, the exchange of ideas in an open environment, and then having the tools to do something about it. And so in 2010, the first community laboratory called GenSpace opened in Brooklyn, New York. They charge just $100 a month. It's a far cry from the $6,000 that the incubators charge. They have a dual mission to educate the public and to innovate. It's remarkable that they talk about educating the public because science was once an elite sport. You had to be wealthy, you had to belong to the right family, or you had to be able to go to a university this isn't something that fits in with the lifestyle of a father with children. However, in do-it-yourself biology, we're seeing those very people, career entrepreneurs, but in technology, start to address the new tech of biology and start companies. My own personal baby, BioCurious, opened a year later after two years of meeting twice a month and trying to get our lab started. We ended up doing this for a ridiculously little sum of money the kind of thing you can do when you're too naive to know any better. This was the mission to give space to all those people who needed it, who had ideas, who had a passion. These are the hackers, the game changers of our society. Now, kids as young as six, I didn't even expect this. Children are modifying E. coli to glow in the dark. And I hope their sentiments are clear. And started by an artist and a school teacher, is a project asking, what if we could take bioluminescent algae, something that occurs naturally, and harness that to light our homes during the night and make a bioluminescent night lab? This project is currently underway, and they're making great strides. And in one of the smallest laboratories that I've seen, Kay All created a lab in her closet, her dorm room closet, of all things, buying equipment off of eBay PCR machine or a DNA copier for as little as $59. She wanted to do genetic experiments in the home, but not just any experiments. This one was personal. Her parents had both found that they carried the gene for hemochromatosis. It's a life-threatening iron storage disorder. And in all likelihood, Kay herself carried the gene, but the test was very expensive. But that wasn't the whole point. She knew how to do this. She had just graduated MIT in their first ever biological engineering class of 2008. She knew she could do it, so she did. The heart of this talk is really the people who are changing the game. In my work in biology, I see parallels in different industries. It's telling me so much that Technology changes, the world changes, but human nature is the same. We see the same type of person change the world. 
And when it comes to science, it's not just the typical scientist anymore, not the PhD would be working alone in the lab, working for professorship for tenure, or trying to get one more paper added to their roster. It is the person working out of passion, the true meaning of the word amateur. Like Hugh Rienhoff, whose daughter Beatrice had a rare disorder, but it was unrecognized. And in Hugh's words, not until you have a diagnosis can you create a cure. So he was lost without anyone to help him. And this man working alone began to genetically test his daughter and begin to find insight into what was happening inside of her body. Today, she is being successfully treated due to his work. And he's created an organization called My Daughter's DNA that helps parents with kids with rare disorders find each other and find that help that they're not getting outside. Cahal Garvey is one of the most prominent do-it-yourself biologists working in the UK out of his mother's spare bedroom. He is the first individual to have gained allowance to do genetically modified experiments outside of a traditional lab. He insists on making science open, affordable, and accessible, as demonstrated by one of his own inventions called the Dremel Fuse. So Dremel is a power tool, it spins really, really fast, and what you see on the bottom fits on top of that thing that spins really fast, and it holds tubes. You put cells in there, when you spin it fast, the cells are sorted. So this is typically found in labs as a fancy centrifuge. So he's done it for a few bucks, and anybody can order this online at Shapeways. Progression is moving even further in Silico, or on your computers, where Angela Zhang, 17-year-old high school student, recently was awarded $100,000 for finding a potential cure for some cancers. But what does this all mean? It is perhaps the most interesting time to be involved in science. And it's not just for the typical researcher. It really is for everybody. People like me, people like you. And in this, we need to find our meaning and then do something about it. You can be a consumer. Today, you can order a genetic testing kit for a few hundred dollars off of 23andMe. And one of their most popular features is to share your genome. This is the future of discovery, gathering information that's intensely personal, but then comparing that to the people around you. No longer is personalized medicine, or no longer is medicine about the average, but it really is going to be about you. Just a couple of years ago, Craig Venter created the first self-replicating bacterial cell. Many found this scary, controversial, intimidating, which it can be, until you understand that the consequences can be so grand for humanity, for our health. Imagine creating vaccine delivery systems personalized to you, or organs that can replace malfunctioning organs at the end of your life. And entrepreneurs are beginning to take shape. This was my own garage lab in 2009, where after a friend died from cancer, we were trying to make headway on a therapy that he was never able to get. And again, naive enough to think that we could do it. We did. We were funded, and we both went on to do, hopefully, great things. But this is what's possible, and this is what's going on under the radar. I encourage you to pay more attention to these people that are shaping the new way of doing research and to get involved and work with those around you. Another quote from Charles Darwin, because I like him so much. In the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. Thank you.